subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. I'm with Dr. Christine Fair, a professor at the Peace and Security Studies program in Georgetown University's Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service in the U.S. in Washington, D.C. Dr. Fair has previously served as political officer with UNAMA, which is the UN Assistance Mission for Afghanistan in Kabul. She has worked with RAND Corporation as well as India's Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis. Dr. Fair has written several books one on the one on the Lashkar -e Toiba called Understanding the Lashkar -e Toiba, as well as several books on the Pakistan Army called one of them called Fighting to the End, the Pakistan Army's Way of War. She's an expert on the politics of India, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. Dr. Fair, welcome to the print. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So uh, Dr. Fay, you know Pakistan and Afghanistan and, and India, of course, really well. In fact, we last met in Herat a couple of years ago, pre-pandemic, pre, -pandemic, pre uh, this mess, this conflict in Afghanistan. But I want your first comments on the protests in Kabul this Monday afternoon, where about a thousand women and men who joined them have come out on the streets chanting slogans against Pakistan, and you see the placards where they say, down with ISI. What, what do you make of this? In Afghanistan knows best. I mean, you have also traveled quite a bit in Afghanistan. I, I've never met an Afghan who had anything but contempt for Pakistan. Um, and, you know, Pakistanis will, will usually feign puzzlement about this. You know, they'll talk about, but we've hosted so many Afghan refugees. But as someone who um, has had been going to Pakistan since 1991 until I got PNG back in 2013, you know, Afghans were, were really treated miserably um, in Pakistan. Um, they were do menial jobs. Uh, a common refrain would be that, oh, Afghans have come here to clean our shoes they were treated with more contempt than even ordinary Pashtuns, right? So Afghans have had a really hard life. And for the most part, they lay that immiseration at the door of Pakistan. And I think for really good reason. I mean, most people think that Pakistan has been doing this only for a few years or a few decades, or maybe it dated back to the Soviet uh, occupation of Afghanistan. But, you know, Pakistan has been trying to subjugate Afghanistan from the 1950s. This has been a 70 year long project. Okay, so let me let me ask you about something that's, you know, caused a lot of commentary here in India, which is the visit of the ISI chief, General Fez Hamid, to Kabul. And he was there, you know, 24 hours or so on Friday. He left on Saturday. Now, and this is about the time that Panshir was being taken by the Taliban. And uh, we know, we don't know where Amrullah Saleh, one of the biggest Afghan leaders, right. we don't know where he is. Ahmed Masood, the son of Commander Masood. He, again, it's unclear where he is, whether he's inside the Panjshir or he's outside the country. But your, the, the question is, what do you think Fez Hamid was doing in Kabul? I think it's pretty obvious what he was doing. He's planning the offensive on Panjshir. Um, I, I haven't heard any confirmation because the, the the country that could confirm this is the United States. But as you know, the Afghans have made a number of accusations and they have shown, they've, you know, posted videos of this to various social media that they believe the Pakistanis themselves were involved in that fight. Uh, they report that the Pakistanis themselves were conducting sorties, whether it was with Pakistani uh, fighter jets or with drones. Um, the idea that the Taliban could operate those drones is kind of risible without ISI assistance. So I think, I think one obvious reason why he was there was to plan this massive offensive uh, on Panjshir, which was the only resistance to the Taliban. And then, of course, you know, there have all the various squabbles amongst the Doha Shura, the Miram Shah Shura, the Falana Falana Shura, but the most important Shura to the Taliban is, of course, the Rawalpindi Shura mm -hmm. and the Abhara Shura, and he was representing both during that visit. So the Abhara Shura, which is uh, this this little uh, ISI enclave in the heart of yes. Islamabad, which is which is supposed yes. to be the headquarters of the Pakistani yes. ISI. 
So, it's a very nice, I've been there. It's an incredible, I mean, compliments of the U.S. taxpayer. I mean, it's a really nice spy layer. Uh, it's got like a koi pond. It's, it's, it's really peaceful. It's amazing what you can do with a lot of U.S. money. So Fez Hamid, they're saying, was there to, uh, to plan the last assault on Panjshir because that was the last sort of spot of resistance against the Taliban? So, you know, I kind of go with, um, I don't like to, when there's a, a, a simple and rational explanation, I tend to go with Occam's razor. Um, maybe he was there to buy carpets. Maybe he was there to buy her rock glass. But I, I, I think that the simplest explanation uh, is often the correct explanation. It, otherwise, it sure is a coincidence, isn't it? So you're saying that, you know, a lot of your Afghan friends or what you see in the social media, a lot of Afghans are talking about this and there's videos of, and we've seen the videos of him in the Serena Hotel lobby. But how is it that the Americans, which have been involved firsthand in this 20 long year war in Afghanistan, how come there's not a peep out of them about Fez Hamid's visit to Kabul? So, you know, uh, this has been my windmill for about 20 most of the 20 odd years that we've been in this war. Um, I, I've lost track of the meetings where I would be the lone voice um, saying, um, we're losing because of Pakistan. Why aren't you doing anything about this? You can't have an Afghan strategy without a Pakistan strategy. And time and time again, the, the glorious white male uh, masters of strategic strategy would say, sit down, we know war, you don't. And I'm like, well, you don't know politics and I do. Um, so I can't give you an answer to that question because I've been asking the same question of my government and, you know, and it's, it's every government since the war began, right? We know that George W. Bush famously, like he did Putin, looked into Musharraf's soul and didn't believe a word of DROG against him. Um, Obama understood Pakistan as the source of the problem. He had Bruce Rydell as his advisor, but never crafted a Pakistan policy. And in fact, under Obama, the, the sluice gates of funding expanded. Um, Trump just wanted to get out of Afghanistan. So while he apparently had considerable contempt for Pakistan based upon whatever source of information he had on Twitter at any given moment, he did give Pakistan the prize, right, with this peace deal. And Biden, um, he's doing what he always wanted to do when he was vice president was get out. So uh, my fear is that with the closure of the embassy, um, the perpetual concern of Afghanistan being a sanctuary for international terrorism, and apparently no one cares that Pakistan is and has been and will be, a sanctuary for terrorism, that the United States is going to do what it's always done, which is it's going to become ever more reliant upon Pakistan as the fire brigade, while ignoring the fact that Pakistan is setting all of those fires for which its services are required. And Pakistan is going to request, and they will probably receive, considerable um, perquisites for cooperating with the United States. But what I'll, I'll lay odds that that will happen. But Dr. Fair, I don't understand, um, you know, why the Americans, okay, yeah. the Americans are the only superpower, a declining power, but nevertheless, still the most powerful country in the world. Now, you have all the intelligence, you have the instruments of power, you have the leverage over Pakistan. What is it? I'm sure every U.S. president that you just recounted understood what the Pakistanis were doing. Um, so why I, Bush did not. Bush did not. I mean, Cheney eventually did. But Bush did not. Um, look, I don't have a look. If, if I had an answer that made me happy, I'd be less miserable <laughs> with my country, right? But I think um, whether we like it or not, and very dubious um, Republican senators like Lindsey Graham, I think, have articulated this quite clearly. Whether the Americans like it or not, Pakistan is a nuclear armed state and it will therefore um, Pakistani feelings will always trump Afghan lies. Mm -hmm. I think also it probably in the same way that uh, Pakistan coerces India 
Pakistan coerces the world, right? It has really been effective at cultivating this idea that it's too dangerous to fail. It fosters the very concerns like, oh, well, nuclear weapons could get into the hands of terrorists, you know, all of this rubbish. But, um, but if you are... The nuclear weapons can fall in the hands of the terrorists. Isn't that true? No, I, I, I actually sound resoundly reject that. And the reason why I resoundly reject it, and I always have, um, is that what, what makes Pakistan able to coerce the world, right, is that um, if India engages in actions which it believes comprise an existential threat to the Pakistani state, that it has command and control over its nuclear weapons to attack India or attack Indian troops on Pakistani soil. Um, if it doesn't have command and control over those weapons, then those threats are vacuous, right? So the, the nuclear weapons to Pakistan is like the most sacred thing, right? It is, it is the command and control over those assets that allows Pakistan to blackmail the world. Now, um, I'll go back to 2007, when for several hours in the United States, the US Air Force lost lost several nuclear warheads. They were actually uh, loaded um, on B-52s and they were flying over the continental United States. So this is a country that has been doing command and control for quite some time. And, and, and that was a hideous accident. And the air chief lost his job, right? There were consequences for it. Um, there was a serious inquiry into how this happened and, and how we can prevent it. So accidents can always happen. Those accidents can happen with India's program. So, but, but the difference is, unlike the perception that Pakistan uses to scare the world into continued to writing checks, Pakistan's interests in securing the command and control of its weapons are aligned with that of the international community. And Pakistan, I'm sure, also understands that if there were to be a, lo a loose nuke scenario, that um, this would probably be a Rubicon uh, upon which not just the United States, but but many actors would, would come to bear upon Pakistan. So, you know, you can't rule out chance, right? You can't rule out someone getting through, but Pakistan has erected a very considerable um, series of both personnel as well as physical barriers to that sort of malfeasance. Mm -hmm. So Fez Hamid's visit is, is basically the culmination of what you're arguing is, is not just a 20 year old um, sort of ingress into Afghanistan, but it goes back many decades. But having said that, today... Seven decades. Seven decades. Seven decades. But would you say today that Pakistan has, has actually won in Afghanistan? It's yes. It's achieved what it Yes. Absolutely. Um, the Pakistan army has only achieved two victories in its entire existence. One is the defeat of democratic forces in its own country and the defeat of a fledgling democracy in Afghanistan. Shabash. Jitgia. So what do you think? Do you think that uh, that it will be able to maintain control? So I have a different view on that, too. Pakistan is never wanted to have control, right? It, it, Pakistan is perfectly happy with chaos. What Pakistan had been fighting against for the last 20 years is actually a stable Afghanistan that was a friend of India and opposed to Pakistan, right? When Pakistan says, oh, we just want stability, it's just utter book fast because if it had wanted stability, it would have done everything it could to shore up the fledgling democracy in Afghanistan. Instead, it continued to support every, you know, type of militant organization ranging from the Taliban uh, to the Haqqani network, uh, Lashkar Taiba. And, you know, for years, I'm sure you, you heard it when, when we were in Afghanistan, you know, the Afghans were absolutely convinced that um, ISIS KP was really ISI KP. And I, if, you, if you look at who ISIS KP are, right, they're defected Taliban commanders, they are people who have left the sectarian groups like Lashkar Jangvi and Sipe Sabe Pakistan. Some of them come from the TTP. These guys aren't Salafi. They're all Deobundis. And so I, I think that 
ISIS KP slash ISI KP serve a really useful function because what Pakistan can then do is say, look, you know, you've got this mess on your hands and, and, and they always do this. You created this mess and we're the victims, you know, here we are trying to, you know, take your, your um, out of the tava and we're going to, we're going to write the check for that. So uh, if I were to ask myself who benefits from the mere existence of ISIS KP, it's actually Pakistan, right? So, you know, the way it plays LET off of Jaish Muhammad, the way it played off Hua and Hum. So it's, it's actually really quite coincidental and also apparently quite beneficial that Pakistan has yet another instrument that it can use to make sure that the Taliban, to some considerable measure, toes the Pindi line. But so, mm -hmm. Dr. Fed, this doesn't this doesn't explain why Zalmay Khalilzad, who is uh, the who was the U.S. Special Envoy for Afghanistan across two administrations, uh, Donald Trump as well as Biden, now he cut a deal with the Taliban without having the Afghan government on board. I mean it. It just, I don't so, what that was about, you know, especially in so the, <clears throat> Well, the Americans, I mean, remember, this goes back to Trump. Trump wanted to get out. The Trump administration viewed the Afghan government as the obstacle, which is, look, I can't explain that because to me it's insane, right? The U.S. government did everything it could to make Ghani look even more illegitimate than he did. So at one point... In fact, in March of 2020, the Bush administration threatened to withhold billions of dollars in aid from Ghani if he didn't come back to the table with the Taliban. The U.S. government did everything it could to persuade Ghani to not hold elections as a, an appeasement to the Taliban, which of course didn't want elections. So what I thought, again, inexplicable, but you could, I mean, look, the Trump administration wasn't known for its strategic genius, but it, it did view the Ghani government as the problem, not the Taliban. Now you, you raised this question of Zalmay. Um, it's not a secret, right? That going back to the late 1990s, Zalmay was trying to normalize and mainstream the Taliban. I mean, his famous trip uh, where he brought the Taliban to the UNICAL headquarters in Texas, I mean, it, it's extraordinary, right? So he had a very early history of mainstreaming the Taliban. the Taliban. And, you know, and I, there's the cynic in me. I, I've been watching this pipeline stuff. You know, the Taliban have consistently indicated their support for a pipeline. The cynic in me is uh, waiting to see if, in fact, you know, Zalmay's dream of becoming the de facto mineral viceroy over Afghanistan doesn't happen. I mean, I, I, when you look at what his personal motivations have long been, they have not been to serve his country. They've been to serve his wallet. So the U.S. spends more than $2 trillion, you know, which is perhaps the GDP of a small country, um, loses several more than 2,000 soldiers to 2,000 Americans in this long 20-year long Plus war. many more contractors many more contractors only to hand, hand over Afghanistan to the Pakistanis, to the Pakistan establishment? Yes. I, you summarized it. So it's, it's, going, it's going back to the 1990s um, where we just handed our Afghan policy over to the Pakistanis in the most short-sighted of ways. So, but they know they're doing this. Yeah, they know they're doing it. And yet they have no illusions. And yet uh, General Miley has been quoted as saying that they could do business with the Taliban. So what do you think is happening now post Taliban taking over? Can we just rewind on what I said about pipelines? Yes, sure. He said we can do business with the Taliban. Mm -hmm. So you can do business with the Taliban. Uh, you've, so what is? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm reading his statement very literally. I mean, it's a bit confusing, Doctor Fair. So on the one hand, you spend it, 20 long years. You do. You spend all this money. You lose a lot of men. You hand over the and women and women, women of course, absolutely, and women, very young women, and you hand over the Afghan prize to the Pakistanis, and now you're willing to do business with the Taliban. Yeah. 
So yeah, I can't, I, I look, I mean, I, like you, it's infuriating and it's stunning. And I also don't think this had to be, but you have to understand look, from, from the point of view of an American policymaker, they know that without a coercive Pakistan policy, defeating the Taliban is impossible. There's a very long literature on counterinsurgency. You can't defeat an insurgency that has the panoptic resources uh, supplied to it by a state sponsor, right? Unless you're willing to take that war to the state sponsor. And the Americans have essentially adjudged, rightly or wrongly, that this is not a war that we can win. So why continue to try? And that if you were to look at the arc of American interests, Pakistan is more important than Afghanistan is. Now, do I like this assessment? Absolutely not. Do I think that this had to happen? Obviously, I don't agree with that. But I think that's the calculus that has motivated this. Right. So two questions from there. The first is that, you know, Biden says we need to get out come what may. Okay, so that's a decision he's taken. And, you know, the previous presidents have taken. And one of the things that we understand is that you want to not be distracted by the Afghan war and focus on China, because that's the country which is now rising. But do you but think they're the same problem? So that's my point. If China and <laughs> Pakistan are black brothers, then how do you how do you explain this then? I mean, is it just sheer short sightedness or what? I don't know, Jyoti. I don't know. Because to me and you, for those of us who, who focus on South Asian security, they are one of the same. So, right? And going and going back, I mean, just, just to, to bring a historical point that I'm not sure everyone fully appreciates, the Chinese and the Taliban always had good working relations, right? Long before 9-11, the Chinese had an understanding with the Taliban that you don't let any of the guys training here operate against China. And China gave the Taliban economic support. They helped build whatever commercial infrastructure, telecommunications infrastructure existed at the time. And um, there were reports on the eve of 9-11, if you just go back and look at the New York Times a few months before 9-11, the Chinese were also really close to formalizing a deal with Osama bin Laden himself. Um, and what, what I think is really fascinating, um, just by way of, of data, if you go back to all of Osama bin Laden's fulminations against various atrocities on Muslims across the world, he never once mentioned China, even though throughout the 1990s, China was in fact waging war against its own Muslims, not just the Uyghurs, all Muslims. So this relationship between China and the Taliban is not recent. Um, the Chinese were always interested in doing work with the Taliban. And look, again, I, Jyoti, go back to the U.S. policy in the late 1990s. We had de facto recognize the Taliban. Right. right. We're going back to the future. Um, so uh, this isn't anything that we haven't done in the past. Right. So and and I, I think the, let me just make this other point, Jyoti, which I, I'm sure will make your head explode. And I don't, and I do not disagree with this, right? I just think there were other ways of handling the problem set. The Taliban to the average American policymaker is not the problem to American interests. They just, they don't, and they're not wrong for the most part, except for the fact that the Taliban provide sanctuary to organizations that do, right? So from the point of view of the average American policymaker, um, and you have to remember, think of the U.S. congressperson as being the American equivalent of a Lok Sabha NP. Right. And I say that with, with all due respect or lack thereof. I think they're fairly comparable relative to the populations because they're coming from the populations that they represent. Um, you know, your average American isn't terribly savvy, probably couldn't identify Afghanistan on a map after all of these years. Mm -hmm. They can't even find Alabama on a map. So, and I'm not joking. It's just, it's America. Um, so they're not our problem. So if you're an average American policymaker, you're asking, why are we putting all of this money into a country um, that's not to fight a force that isn't our problem? Mm -hmm. And so, though I do not agree with that 
in totality, because I see second order effects, they are not wrong in that simple formulation. Right. And if you're looking over the horizon, if it's a zero sum game, Pakistan and Afghanistan, and to considerable measure it is, they've decided that we're going to stop making the Taliban our enemy. No, that, absolutely. But you know, this reminds me of this comment by Hamid Gul, uh, a, a previous uh, chief of the ISI, who said that, you know, when the Soviets were defeated in 1989, that Pakistan helped America defeat the Soviet Union. And there will be a day when Pakistan helps America defeat America. And I think that day has come. Oh, I would say, you know, it, it came long before that. I mean, you know, the 20th anniversary of 9-11 is upon us. And I reflect upon this with great sorrow because as traumatic as that day was, and I was, I was a sentient adult, um, mm -hmm. he did not defeat America. America defeated America. We sacrificed all of our principles with setting up these black bases of torture at Guantanamo, Bagram, outsourcing torture to other dubious regimes. We compromised our freedom. We became xenophobic. Um, every kind of hate was normalized and um, politicians really took advantage of this. They learned that fear was a very effective tool of winning. And, and I do mean in particular Republicans, but the Democrats um, haven't really had an effective recourse. So, you know, bin Laden couldn't do to us what we did to ourselves. Mm -hmm. The America that I live in today is not the America. And I've never been a nationalist. Like, I, nationalism really creeps me out. But before 9-11, I don't think I could have imagined the United States in which I live. Right. I, I, I draw a fairly direct line between the events of 9-11 and January 6th. So let me ask you a couple of, um, I, I, I need to ask you this Bin Laden question. You know, uh, at the Jaipur Literature Festival a couple of years ago before the world changed, Adrian Levy, who's this well-known writer and he's written a book on, on Osama Bin Laden, yeah, I know. said yeah. that... And his wife, he and his wife, they co-authored those books. Let's give... That's right. They're a team. They are a team. And at the time, he'd written this book on Osama bin Laden a couple of years ago. And he said, and I remember this very clearly, that the Pakistani intelligence or the Pakistani military establishment was not aware that uh, bin Laden was living in Abbottabad, a stone's throw away from the Kakul Military Academy. I mean, that was a bit surprising considering he had the kind of access and he's written so many books um, on Pakistan, India, um, and now there was this comment. What do you make of it? So, I mean, I can tell you that there's wide concurrence that that's the case. Um, I Now, Carlotta Gall, I think, has been the singular person to push back on that, and, and she's received some criticism of her source. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know of any American official that holds a contrary view. Now, I the U.S. believes I, that the Pakistani establishment did not know Osama bin Laden was living there. So, look, I don't go into a skiff. Like, I'm a professor. But um, the circles in which I travel, um, we have no evidence that they did. So, if you're going to go by the scientific method, we don't have, and the null hypothesis is they didn't know, then we have no evidence to reject that hypothesis. Um but what I so there's two things though that are germane to me, right? The most important thing that's germane to me is that they have not, meaning the Pakistani state, have not made it has not made any meaningful efforts to figure out how it was that he lived in Pakistan for so long, right? The only person that they've arrested was Dr. Shaquille Afridi, that's, that's right. um, and and that under really strange law they've accuse him of violating the frontier crimes regulation when he's not, to my knowledge, a, a resident um, at the time of FATA. So they haven't made any effort to, to learn this. And I think that in of itself is puzzling, right? Because if, if your country is found to be harboring one of the world's most wanted terrorists, and you had been saying for 11 years, there's no way he's here, and he's there a mile from Kakul, um, 
you would probably want to know how that happened. So to me, that obviously casts a lot of doubt. Now, look, I know how these, I know how the ISI works with these safe houses, right? I can tell you a, a scenario by which he hides in plain sight. So essentially, it kind of works like this. Every, by the way, people in Abbottabad knew that that was, they, they called it, uh, they called it a Waziristan house, right? The people who were there knew that bad guys were there. I mean, there people who, who were interviewed, they said, yeah, we knew something was up with that house. But let me give you an example like, that maybe, maybe your, your viewers would understand. If you lived in Mumbai in a flat, and you were you you thought that maybe one of Daoud Ibrahim's associates <laughs> were living above you. Would you call the police? No. <laughs> See my point. So you could they, they could hide him in plain sight because once a house is de basically designated as a safe house, it's like, huh? Unke pasto hein? It this guy has it. Um, you don't have to worry about it. And you're, you know that the residents aren't going to call the police because they're going to assume that the police are in on it. So if you know South Asia well, as you do, and you just think about a comparable situation in India, you can see how a, a, a known dastardly person of international disrepute could hide in plain sight. And so this does not mean that the ISI had no knowledge of it. Right. What it does mean is that they were operating under indirective control. Mm -hmm. So, so I, it's, it, it isn't implausible, but to me, the biggest smoking gun is that they've never tried to figure out, which if they're not trying to figure it out, it means Uncle Patahe. Okay, so Chelya, let's uh, cut to the present. Now, Afghanistan has been taken over by the uh, by the Taliban. Fez Hamid has visited. Sirajuddin Haqqani of the Haqqani Network is the new Interior Minister, uh, and and there is and he, by the way, has a five million dollar bounty on his head. So and he's a designated foreign terrorist by the United Nations, no less, and by the United States, and by the he's United designated. States. How do you think? You know. So what happened? So how does Pakistan, which you said a few minutes ago, you believe that it has won this round at least in the battle for Afghanistan? How, how do you think this is going to play out? Disastrously. In what way? So when Trump and Biden said that Afghanistan is not going to be a sanctuary for international terrorism, I mean, I, you and I, I'm, we sniggered at this. It, it already is a bastion for international terrorism. So, I mean, I, the people with whom I associate um, who are career government folk who are not political appointees, they fear that we're going to be sucked back in. And... I, I have to say, I, I share that assessment. Um, I remember when 9-11 happened, when I was at RAND, I was on a small project with Dan Byman, and we basically were doing a, you know, what does the immediate future for Afghanistan look like? And I remember all the, the war planners, they were very concerned about how many stingers the Taliban may have had from the anti-Soviet war what are they going to be thinking about in the next conflict? How many Blackhawks are still functional? Right. So do you think the Pakistani establishment is going to continue to help the new government in Kabul? Of course. Oh my goodness. Of course they are. Um, and by help, um, and it's not just them, right? The Chinese are going to be a pretty important partner. I'm sure the cut the look, um, Look at the, the consulates that are open right now in Kabul, right? It is Pakistan, it's China, it is Russia, it's Iran. And look at this international coterie of weasels that are going to be acknowledging this government and helping it get on its legs. Obviously, Qatar is, is one of those countries. Um, and it's, it's interesting. We're gonna, I, I'm, I'm wondering how long it's going to take for the other Gulf state monarch from UAE to try to compete with Qatar, right? Because like they are, 
they have their own strategic differences. Are they going to be content to let um, Qatar um, be the singular Arab influence in Afghanistan? So I think once Qatar opens up its funding, I, I think the, the other Gulf state monarchs are going to follow suit just as they did in Taliban 1.0. I don't think they're going to have any problems with funding, Jyoti. They don't need international recognition. They don't need Western democratic or Indian approval, right? They don't need it. They've got what they need. Speaking of India, do you think that, how do you think India has managed this whole um, situation and do you think it could have done this better? So India's in a tough spot. So I'm not an Indian, non-Indian taxpayer. You know, I don't, I don't really think that's in my wheelhouse, right? But I mean, as someone who is, who is, um, who believes that India is an important uh, state in global security. You know, India has, hadn't really resolved a lot of debates for itself, right? I mean, I felt really bad for Indian diplomats who were highly exposed. They, they didn't have the kinds of security that their counterparts enjoyed. Um, and so Indian diplomats were, were taking all of these risks to be the face of India. And I don't think your average Indian had really any appreciation of the risks that they faced. And I mean, how many Indians have died over the course of this conflict as a percentage of the Indians that, that were officially sent to India or to Afghanistan? Um, you know, India didn't want to send troops to Afghanistan. I don't think the Americans wanted them to because of the constant appeasement of Pakistan. So India made space for itself where it could but I don't think India really had a strategy. But having said that, I don't think anyone had a strategy. But the space in which India operated was much more constrained. And I don't, correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Mahodra, I don't ever recall a discussion amongst Indians about what are we doing? What are we trying to do? What is the cost that we're willing to pay to execute our mission in Afghanistan, right? I mean, Americans, we've been subjected to all sorts of embattled debates over the last 20 years, a very vigorous debate, not the least of which by our policymakers, right? Our elected representatives. I don't really recall such sustained discussions amongst India and among, amongst Indians. And without that kind of discussion, how do you set the price for your objectives? Right. So right. I think that's that's been the problem for India for quite some time. Well, it's been, in, you know, you're right that in the political space, that discussion hasn't really uh, taken place. But, you know, uh, I think I'm old enough to remember writing a story in the early in 2002. So soon after 9-11, where the uh, where India wanted to open its consulates in southern Afghanistan, which it which it did ultimately in Kandahar and Jalalabad and Herat, of course, uh, in the West. And the U.S. was quite upset that India wanted to open these consulates because the Pakistanis were upset that India was opening. So this triangle between India, Pakistan and the U.S. has been, you know, has, is, it's like a sub story to the big story, of course, that's been unfolding yep. for the last two years. Exactly. Yep. No, I agree with that. That's why I'm just really sympathetic to the constraints. Um, we don't know what, what India would have done if the United States hadn't constantly been getting in India's business um, out of consideration for Pakistan's feelings, right? Right, on this note, Dr. Fair, thank you so much for your, um, for your time, for your expertise, for speaking to the print. You are so kind, I miss you.